introducing our moderator, Malika Jabali, and author, Tori Johnson Jones. Mrs. Tori Johnson Jones, singer, songwriter, author, and entrepreneur, Tori Johnson Jones is a self described multi potentialite, a person with multiple skill sets and disciplines. Tori created and founded LoudSilenceBrand.com, a style and culture brand that creates spaces for ideas to cross connect. Please join me in welcoming the extraordinaires, Malika Jabali and Tori Johnson Jones. So excited to join my sister, Alamaze. I've known Ala for almost all of my life, and she's been a mentor. A, a muse, like just she was the coolest woman I, I knew when I was a kid. So and and now, um, so I'm so excited to share the stage with you. Call her Alla. Y'all will know her as Tori Johnson Jones. So I may refer to her as Alla. Don't be confused because she's my sis. Um, so Alla, I read both of your books, and you know she's a, a two-time author. The Soil Is Good, which was for young girls, and then a Girls Survival Guide to Womanhood that is for teenagers but both of them I found it kind of reflects your own spirit because when when we were younger me and my homegirls we would go to Alamaze's duplex in Kirkwood and she treated us like we were kind of her peers like she treated us kind of maturely and I feel like that's what you did <laughs> with both of these books because even though they're for girls and teenagers there's this awareness you're talking about mental health and a lot of people don't do that for you know children so can you talk some more about that, like the fact that you wanted to kind of go a little bit deeper, you're talking about the subconscious mind and you're talking about mental health and trauma in both of these. So. so I didn't realize until I published the second book, A Girl's Survival Guide to Womanhood, Close to Grow, Close to Grow and Go, how much the first book, The Soil is Good, and this book really have a um, constant theme. And the theme really is the subconscious mind. The Soil is Good is a children's book, and it was inspired by a book I read many years before that um, called The Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. When I finished the book, I felt like, how come I didn't know about this when I was a little kid, how my subconscious mind works? How come no, no one ever talked to me about my subconscious mind, how it, how it works, how I can use it? I just explained using seed and soil how it works it's super simple a lot of adults read it to their children and they're like okay wait a minute you just reminded me so it really is just a reminder it's not revolutionarily new information it's just reminders and so the soil is the um a girl survival guide to womanhood has the kind of quotes intentionally in the book that is intended to interrupt thought patterns that no longer serve and it's intended to reminds us who we are because the soul always knows. So. I love that. That's another quote. The soul always knows. Y'all can take that with you. So jumping right into that, if you want to read, this is your kind of your dedication from the author. You want to read that. So this book is intended to all the girls and women across the world. May your decisions be made from the wisdom and intelligence of the soul. Um, I think that a lot of us suffer from trauma. A lot of us suffer from childhood trauma and we just grow up, we just get older. And I think that um, in order for shifts to take place, you need to have a toolbox, you need to have new information. And proverbs and quotes have a rhythm to it and a repetition to it, to them. And it literally is a toolbox. You pick it up, you can play with it, you can use it, let it settle, let it resonate. And literally, it when the stuff happens, when life happens, when tragedy happens, um, when trauma happens, it literally is just, let me not say the same self-deprecating things I've been saying to myself for the past several decades. Let me instead choose to replace this with something else, something that has a rhythm, something that jolted me, something that interrupted what I was thinking about myself before, and something that really resonates. How many times have you all read something that just jolted you? Like it literally reminded you, wow. Like so there's lots of quotes, several quotes in this book that's intended to do just that. This, this constant 
course, and your quotes your, yourself have been kind of a perpetual um, like voice in my mind as well. So if you don't mind briefly, I'm going to mention our story about how you would always tell me to keep going. And this fits in line with Alamaze building the spirit of community, you know, not just with this book, but just in her actual life. And so she called me up, this was like randomly, maybe three years ago maybe two years ago time just goes by I was in New York I remember the moment I was in New York in my bed tired and in the midst of figuring out my transition because y'all heard you know I was an attorney I am an attorney but I wanted to do more journalism happened and I wanted to write wanted to write and a lot of that that was pushing me was Alamaze so she called me that morning randomly she was like Malika keep going like I just wanted to call you and tell you that keep going and I it just stayed with me and when I was on the verge of giving up, I was doing an article, that's the one that is now made me a finalist for that award. Because I remember Alamaze telling me, keep going. So you built this community of women, and can you talk more about your introduction in terms of creating this book for a community of women? The chapter called The Why, it was so important to me because I didn't just want to have a book of quotes. That's kind of easy to do. I wanted you to understand, the reader to understand why I'm offering these quotes. And in the why, uh, the chapter is just giving you a little bit about my upbringing. And my mother is the inspiration for the book. I pay a lot of homage and respect to her because she raised me with quotes. Um, she was pers a person of very few words. I literally remember um, at 16 or so, I would wake up late for school and I would be scrambling, like, you know, oh, my shoes, my pants, oh my God, I'm late, I'm gonna be late. And she would have her work outfit, a cup of coffee in one hand. And I'm like, mom, can you just take me to school real quick? And she would just super casually look at me and say, your lack of planning does not constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> and so at 16, that sounds like an entire paragraph. And of course, I roll, I would roll my eyes, and then she will follow up with, and you better get there before first period. Like, don't let them call me and say you were late. So the lesson, of course, I was fuming and angry at 16, and but by the end of the day, I, the lesson for me the next day was you better prepare the night before because she's not taking you to school. And she sat at her computer and she wrote this letter to me and said, Dear Tori, we've come a long way since our major discussion a few weeks ago, at least in terms of the manner in which, our communica our, in which we communicate. During our hot issues, I experienced a decrease in the old anger and in the sparring. If we keep this up, we will have a much more rewarding relationship. For my part, I am committed to continuing along this path. Insofar as your promise to do better, as you put it, I feel you are making you are making an effort still there are things that slip by this doesn't negatively influence my feelings about you however as a responsible parent I must allow you to experience the consequences of your behavior whether that behavior is positive or negative or intentional or unintentional at the same time I want to help you to become responsible as you grow towards your independence you are a remarkable person and even even remarkable people can use a bit of assistance from time to time in order to make sure you know what I expect from you around and about the home front, I, am, I have prepared a list of helping hand tasks that will serve as your contribution to making ours a happier home. And so everything that my mom was supposed to do wrong, she did right. She married a man that was just another race. She dealt with a lot of conflict at that time. That was in the early 90s. Um, wait, where year were you born? 91. That's my brother from that union. So I actually teased my brother that his dad was my dad before him. Like, before he got here, his dad and I had already established a relationship. So I share a little bit how, um, what my stepfather poured into me. And the irony is, um, who I, who I am today as a black woman, he helped me to become that.
So that's how I um, want these quotes. I also have at the end of each chapter a to-do uh, for the reader um, so that some of this stuff can resonate. Um, one of the chapters is called Quick Life Lessons. And one of the things she used to always say, especially on a Saturday morning when I wanted to sleep in, the early bird gets the worm. I'm like, well, F that bird. Like, I'm asleep. You know, but she was just the early bird. She was just very, it was just very normal. The early bird gets to work. And so um, now I get up at five o'clock in the morning. And I get up at five o'clock not because I have to, but because that's my time to meditate. It's my time to pray. That's my time to exercise. It's my time to write. And I do all of this before my house wakes up so that my well can be full. And it's just amazing how you get to a certain point in your life and all of the things that our imperfect parents have taught us. Um, it's, it's, it's true, like it's, it's real. And fortunately I get to pass this stuff down to my wild child. Look different, be uncertain and still succeed. Misty Copeland. Um, oh, I really love this, Dr. Lizette Ojeda. The last thing you should do is do things for money because that's not going to drive you when things get rough. Um, this, I have a chapter called Wealth. A lot of this is really unlearning what you believe is true. And we get, we get a lot of our beliefs from our well-intended parents, teachers, community leaders, grandparents, and we, we start being in our 20s, 30s and up and we're like, well, my mama said or grandma said, but how is this working for you? Some things you have to unlearn and it's scary to unlearn what you, what your parents taught you or what someone that you trusted taught you. It doesn't mean that they're right or wrong. They're just operating from what somebody else gave to them. Taught, however, to have linear careers. And when you are outside of that, people kind of, well, what are you going to do? And you need to figure out something and you, you know, that those type of things. But um, for me, it's just not just unlearning, but trusting what's in my gut and what's in my soul. And again, having a, a yes you can mom really, really helped. Like I knew then I was kind of outside of the box at 16 um, and, uh, and I fortunately had parents and I had a community that accepted my, I guess, whimsicalness, if you wanna say that. So um, unlearning some stuff. That's my magic power. That's my superpower. I can unlearn things and I'm okay with unlearning. I like when my brain explodes from unlearning something because then I can now replace it with something that always takes me to the grander version of myself. Recall a time when you had to unlearn something? Was there a bigger, a big lesson that you unlearned? Um, I guess without thinking deeply, I thought that when a woman gets pregnant in nine months, she has a baby. That's not a fact. It's not a fact. And I'm able to serve and support other women who also believe that to be true. And sometimes when you know that you're not alone, you know that you haven't, uh, you don't have to go through this by yourself, um, you can start to breathe. And a lot of times, tragedy breathing is the first step but breathing is the first step and um, for me I had to take away those things that I thought was true oh you get pregnant you have a baby oh that's not always true for people and so yeah I had to accept that and to use my my messes use my mistakes to serve and support and help other people so that we're all connected and we're not by ourselves so I'm not technically a therapist and I have so much respect for therapists and the study involved, but I know that I heal people and I do know that I change lives. And it took a long time for me to actually say that, but I own it now because it comes up in my life all the time. I feel like the Holy Spirit brought this to me. I remember the car accident in high school. I had no idea that God was preparing me for chaplaincy then. Cause I came and you didn't want no visitors. I was in a bad car accident yeah. when I was in high school. 
Um, I was, uh, a person died in a car with us. It was eight people in a car. Uh, I broke my femur in half. I have lifetime scars, but that's the, what she's referring to. And she didn't want no visitors. And I was like, well, Tori is going and I'm here. And she's like, I don't want you to see me like this. I said, I don't care. I said, so, you know, I went in and her face was disfigured. But for me, I did not see her face. I saw Tori. So the face didn't matter to me. And I stayed and I visited with her. That has been with me my whole life. And it's just a pivotal point as well with the Holy Spirit letting me know I call you into chaplaincy. And I didn't know he was preparing me even then. But you have made a great impact on my life. Thank you, the tears. <laughs> you just never know who you impact. I didn't know um, at 16 and 17 what was on me that I was giving people. But I also have, to, again, credit not just my mother, but this church, Shrines of the Black Madonna, this community. Um, I feel like I have permission here. I feel like I have freedom here. I feel like I have a lot of moms, big sisters um, that see me smile, encourage me. Um, and I feel like that all of that being fed into me allowed me to be that person I was for you as a teenager. Um, so thank you for sharing that.